to go. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amazing love. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Y'all may be seated. Thank you so much again, as always. Uh, Tim, tremendous job. And all of you for sharing. Uh, it just, it, it never ceases to amaze me how the Spirit speaks to our spirits and our spirits jive, you know, they connect. And it's just, it's crazy, but it's, it's, it's cool too, praise the Lord. It's just amazing. And I appreciate it so much. So, Tim, again, I thank you. And uh, Suzanne and, T and uh, Peter, thank you for leading us in worship. Great music, by the way. I appreciate the choices. Tremendous. And Mike and Suzanne, as always, for, for everything that they're doing day in and day out. And I appreciate them so much. And all of you, appreciate you. And all of you that are on uh, Facebook joining us now online. And uh, we appreciate you. You're as much a part of this church as, as anybody. You just happen to be distance at the moment. But uh, as I said, our, our spirits are all one in Christ. And so we're together. Whether you're here physically or not, we're, we're looking forward to when we can all be together and uh, that you will be able to return. But in the meantime, we love you and we appreciate your worship and uh, loving the Lord with us. Praise God. God's good. Amen. And he is great all the time. Hallelujah. Uh, the zookeeper noticed an orangutan reading two books. One on origin of species and the Bible. And so surprised uh, was the uh, zookeeper that he asked the orangutan, why are you reading both of those books? And the orangutan said, well, I just wanted to know if I'm my brother's keeper or my keeper's brother. <laughs> Thanks, the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> okay, since we're on this uh, kind of religious theme, what did Buddha say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. <laughs> Praise God. I may have said this before, but I think it's worth repeating. If ignorance is bliss, why aren't more people happy? Yeah. <laughs> because they don't think they're ignorant. Yeah, there you go. Praise the Lord. And, you know, I've said this, I think, maybe before, too, but I've always wanted to be someone all my life. And I can see now I should have been more specific. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If I look confused, it's only because I'm thinking. All right. Praise the Lord. Let's get to the real serious business here. Amen. God's always in a good mood, and so we should, we should try to be as well. But I want to, Peter, if you will, let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, uh, 1 through 5. And uh, I hope you all see the same connections that I see. I don't think I'm just randomly putting things together. Uh, it's, it just surprises me how the Lord speak so subtly and we don't even sometimes know that he's speaking to us we're just going through the motions thinking we're doing what we got to do and then you find out whoa that was god and it's it's always amazing it's always great but it's even better when we're sensitive enough to know it when he is speaking not after the fact so praise the lord but in isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 5 it says in the year that king uzziah died i saw also the lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings. With twain they covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me! For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Praise the Lord. So when, when King Uzziah died, and this is what's in here. Can you go back to verse 1 again, Peter? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne. So it's, it, it, it's fascinating to me that when King Uzziah died, his earthly throne was emptied. But Isaiah looked above that earthly throne to see another throne 
that's never empty. Praise the Lord. There are times, I'm not prophesying, I'm just saying this is a fact. There are times when God has to empty on one throne in order to focus our human attention on His throne. And I'm not saying, I'm not predicting, I'm not prophesying, I'm just saying all the focus is on the presidency and so forth in this country. But what God is saying is sometimes He has to stir things up here for us to look beyond the things we're depending on and the things we're trusting in here to see where our true source is. Amen. And that's what Isaiah saw because he, him and Uzziah, he was close to Uzziah. He thought he was a great guy, great king and all this stuff. But he said, well, I'm looking, I see the throne is empty and I see another throne that captures my attention, a throne that is never empty. Praise the Lord. And so there's a release of power that exists in the presence of the unfiltered glory of God. And is it possible to be in His presence and not comprehend His glory? That's the question I'm asking myself. And, uh, you know, the seraphim said, the whole earth is full of His glory. Amen. They saw something that humanity wasn't aware of and may not be even to this day. It's a question of perception. And that was, that's already been spoken here this morning. And that's why I'm saying that it's so unique of God to join us together in spirit and in thought, amen, to validate and verify the things that he's saying to each one of us separately so that when we come together, we see that, you know, like that you were right. That was me. I was talking to you, you know. And so these seraphim, they lived in the glory. That's, that's their existence. That's where they are. Amen. So when they opened their eyes and they looked at the earth, they only saw the earth through the glory of God. Amen. They saw the glory before problems. They saw the glory before sin. They saw the glory before failure. They could say from where we're standing, the whole earth is full of the glory of God. It's like they're saying, we aren't interested in the possibility of defeat. It doesn't exist where we are. Amen. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing what you folks were saying this morning. And I'm telling you, it's the Lord that is speaking through His people. The declaration of victory has already been confirmed. Jesus said it. Look in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. He said, who do men say I am? Who are they seeing? And Peter said, you're the, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, and on that truth, on that reality, I'm going to build a church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's us, folks. The gates of hell have no, no power over us. All he can do is scare you. All he can do is try to intimidate you. He has no power over you. For the earth shall be filled or full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So what's your perspective? In the glory, through the glory, I see signs and wonders and miracles. I see the dead being raised. I see a people taking authority over demonic forces. I see an outpouring like we've never seen before. Yes. Joel 2, 28 through 30. And it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire. Pillars of smoke. Keep, keep that in mind. Pillars of smoke. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. So we've got to perceive His glory. Nothing is going to happen until we see things from God's perspective. Amen. When Moses saw the backside of the glory, he was in a rock. When Paul saw the glory, he was knocked off his donkey. When John saw the glory, he fell on his face. And that's the kind of glory that's going to fill the church 
and fill this earth before this is all said and done. Praise the Lord. Those who are, have been so proud and arrogant are going to be laying on their face before God, before the glory of God, and acknowledging Him for who He truly is. It's the knowledge of the glory of God. We've got to see it from God's vantage point. Isaiah 6 and 2 again, if we can go back there. Above this throne, he saw in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. You know, that's the only time that seraphims are mentioned in the Scripture. The word seraphim actually means shiny, fiery ones. They didn't have their own in inherent glory. They were reflections of of the fiery, shiny glory of God. They reflected God. In Isaiah's vision, there were at least two of them flying around the throne of God. Each had six wings. Two they covered their feet, two they covered their face, and with two they did fly. And what did they do while they were flying? Holy, holy, holy. Yes. Now we've always imagined, or at least I have, that they were speaking to God. I think they may have been speaking to themselves, reminding each other of the holiness that is in the presence of God. As far as we know, they had a one-word vocabulary. Holy, holy, holy. There's no record of them ever saying anything else. They were gripped by the presence of an awesome, holy, awesome, powerful, majestic God. And they also saw him high and lifted up. They saw the king of all the earth, his glory and his train filling the temple. You know, the Hebrew language doesn't have superlatives. In English, you know, we say that's the highest, that's the greatest, that's the lowest, that's the sweetest. You know, we have ways of, of exaggerating or expanding on individual words. Well, in Hebrew, they don't have that. So in order to express superlatives, the Jews repeat the same word. The highest superlative in their language is a word that's used three times. For instance, now, Jesus didn't use the word three times because it wasn't the highest, but he used it. He spoke Aramaic, Aramaic which is a type of uh, Hebrew and uh, kind of a slang version of it, I suppose you'd say. But he, he would say, verily, verily, to express a point. Just to let you know, this is serious. I'm, I'm not just talking randomly here. I have a point that I'm trying to make, and I want to get your attention so that you realize how important it is. Instead of saying, this is the greatest of the greatest of the greatest of God, they said, holy, 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 the highest superlative that's spoken. Repeatedly, whenever you repeat it, it, it doubled and tripled the intensity of the meaning. Look at Luke uh, 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I mean, we read these scriptures, but do, do we really believe? I mean, are we really grasping... This God and His authority and His power that He has given to us. For with God, nothing, nothing, that means nothing, shall be impossible. So let, look at Ephesians 1, 17 through 23. This is, this is Paul's prayer that God gave him to share with us. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, 
gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Praise the Lord. So we can't look at God, what he's trying to get across to us and what we've shared already here this morning. We can't look at God through our problems. We have to look at our problems through God. The earth is in bad shape, seraphim. They're in bad shape, guys. Holy. There's a lot of sin down here, seraphim. Holy. Don't you see all of our failures, seraphim? Holy. Their response was basically from where we're standing, all we can see is revival. From where we're standing, the earth is full of his glory. So why should we get hung up on anything else? That's the reality. That's the truth. That's where all reality comes from is the spirit realm. When the seraphim cried, holy, holy, holy to each other, the pillars, the scripture says, began to move. And the throne room was filled with the smoke. Where did it come from? Look at Isaiah 6 and 6 again. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6. Remember those pillars? Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6. And then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. So an altar was burning. Worship and praise were being offered, and from this altar... Smoke was filling the air. So what caused that smoke to fill the room instead of just hovering over the altar as it would normally do? The voice of angels. The seraphim. Right? Holy, holy, holy. And the smoke is spreading out and filling the entire room. Worship should be uncomplicated. And it's personal. How we interact with God. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about just the ritual of, you know, doing certain things at certain times. He's talking about the relationship that we have. That's where real worship comes from. That's what God is looking for is that intimacy, that personal relationship that he receives worship from. The doorposts. With just, I mean, just a cursory study of this, the doorposts didn't move till worship began. Scripture says God inhabits the praises of his people. So look at uh, 1 Timothy 3.15. This, I just love this. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Praise God. Paul said, we're the pillar. We are what's moved by the holy, holy, holy. We are the pillar and ground of truth. Pillar and ground. Spirit and in truth. What did God say? Jesus told the people, he said, the day is coming when you're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. In pillar and ground. Humans will have total access to God, interaction with God. The spirit is supported by truth, and truth is supported by the spirit. We heard that already this morning. There's... there's Opinions, there's facts, and there's truth. The one thing that never changes is the truth. The others are changing constantly, and we all know that. When Jesus is present, he's the truth, the way, and the life. So when Jesus is present, things move. Things change. Zephaniah 1 and 9. Praise the Lord. 
And I think God is speaking to his church more. Or maybe it's just we're more conscious. Maybe we're just more sensitive to it or, or, or looking for the answers more. I don't know, but I do know that we're hearing more from God than we ever have before. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. You know, the scripture talks about in the last days, goats and sheep will be separated. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians, who go to churches, who don't operate in faith whatsoever, who don't believe in anything other than I'm going to die and go to heaven. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm saying they're not operating as Christians while they're alive. So... In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Lord says, I'm going to get you for jumping over the threshold. Praise the Lord. Well, to us that sounds ridiculous, but they understood what it was he was talking about. Because, you know, what difference should it make whether, you know, you, you jump over a threshold or not? Why punish people for jumping over a threshold? I mean, what's wrong with it? Well, here's the key. When the ark was captured by the Philistines, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. You know the story. They took the ark in, and their God falls over and crumbles. So he says, In the same day also will I punish. And the Philistines took the ark of God, brought it, in, brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon, their God, their main God. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, the next day, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morning, the following morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Praise God. The Bible says that from that day on, the Philistines would not walk over that threshold again. They'd jump over it. To the Philistines, it was a way to acknowledge the power of God, the power of the true God, the God of Israel, the one who had destroyed their God. So they wouldn't step on the, on the threshold and evidently, Israel thought it was cool. So they decided to imitate the act. God wants intimacy. He wants relationship, not, not fake, not routine, not ritual, not rites, not just somebody did it, so I've got to do it. You know, that's what our denomination does, so we've got to do it. He doesn't want that. He wants intimacy. He wants one-on-one. -on -one. He wants personal intimacy. That's true worship. That's what he calls true worship. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 6 and 1 again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the, also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So who did Isaiah see? Look at John 12, 36 through 41. He says here, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. This is Jesus speaking. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet, he's referring to this very section of scripture. The Lord who hath, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. He saw Jesus. Praise the Lord. Jesus of the New Testament was Jehovah of the Old Testament. The Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. Look at John 1, 14. And we all know this scripture, but it's, it's worth looking at again. And we beheld His glory, the glory of, as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. 
The Word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When Isaiah saw the one on the throne, he saw the same one who came in the flesh as the Son of God. Isaiah saw it in future tense. We see it present tense. He saw it in symbol. We see it in substance. It's just like the prodigal. If only I can get back to the glory. And the Father comes running to share all of His glory with us, the sons and daughters of God. We look at ourselves in the light of His holiness. The greatest glory of God is the grace of God. It's found in His presence. His throne is the throne of grace. His favorite seat is the mercy seat. There's nothing we can do except worship and leave ourselves to the mercy and the grace of the Lamb of God. And that is more than sufficient. Because He was accepted, <clears throat> we are accepted. We're accepted in the Beloved. He's our righteousness. He's our Savior. He's our King. And I want the power of His glory. I want the smoke to fill this temple. I want manifest glory. We've got to learn to see ourselves in the light of His glory. Then we can see, like the seraphim saw, through the power of His glory. How bad is it? Holy. What a mess. Holy. Don't understand. Holy. It's all going to hell. Holy. What are we going to do? Holy. I don't understand it. Holy. High and lifted up. Above all doubts. Above all fears. Above all lies. Holy. 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 Give him praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We're seated with him in heavenly places. We need to be seeing through the glory. Seeing things from the eyes of God's, God's perspective because that's how things are going to change. He is holy. And we share in that holiness because we are his. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Praise the Lord. And nothing can come against him, nor his people. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. And nothing is impossible to our God. I ain't scared of no stinking election. I ain't afraid of no stinking COVID-19. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. My Abba. Hallelujah. We need to be a reflection. Not necessarily in the way that we look, not even always in the way that we act, but in the words that come out of our mouth have to be the same words that come out of those seraphims who are in his presence and who always know the truth because they're always with the truth. Next time some crap comes on the TV, you need to just holy that right on out the back door. Praise the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Glory to God. Give the Lord one more hand. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Love you all. Amen. Operate from your position. You've got authority. You're sitting on a throne there with Jesus. You have a right to the holiness of God and to exercise it in this earth. Praise God. And that's exactly what God's going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed in His mighty name. Have a great week, everybody.